Hello, and welcome to St. Andrew. It is my privilege to welcome you here today from the St. Andrew Sanctuary. I am grateful, as always, to share this sacred online space with you, where we are all invited, included, and valued as vital and beloved members of our broader worshiping community. St. Andrew is proud to be an open, affirming, inclusive congregation that welcomes all people into the full life and communion of our church. This includes saints and sinners, believers and skeptics, the lost and the found, the wanderers and the wanderers, families of all shapes and sizes, and people from every point along life's journey. No matter who you are or where you've been, no matter what you believe or even if you believe anything at all, you are welcome here and you belong here. If you have any questions about our church, prayer requests for our care team, or if you would like to get in touch with a member of our pastoral team or staff, please email info at gostandrew.com. If you would like to explore deeper engagement with the St. Andrew community through our many classes, group life gatherings, and service opportunities, you can email us directly at connect at gostandrew.com. We'd love to hear from you. Lastly, to contribute a financial gift to the work and ministry of St. Andrew, you can always visit gostandrew.com slash give or text St. Andrew to 28950. And now let's listen together to this week's scripture and sermon. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love and those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Do you have any recurring dreams? You know, the repeat offender kind of dreams that show up unannounced like mafiosos on the doorstep of your consciousness to remind you that we have some unfinished business to address? About 75% of adults experience recurring dreams and some of the most common ones include falling, flying, losing your teeth, returning to school, taking an exam you didn't study for, not being able to speak, public nakedness, that's the worst one. Some are just cruel, like the one I have when it's Sunday morning and I'm walking at a church during the opening hymn and suddenly it occurs to me that I never actually got around to writing the sermon and I don't know what I'm going to say, but I still have time because there are eight verses to this hymn and then the music stops and it's just me and all those blank stares and the sad sound of sheer silence. I have another recurring dream, a better one. I bet you probably have had this one. It's where I'm in my house or a house my dream says is my house and I suddenly realize that I'm in a room I've never actually been in before. It's a room that's always been there, apparently, only I never knew about it. Sometimes it's down a hallway or up or down a flight of stairs. I, I enter the room and there's all this stuff I've never seen before. Books, furniture, knickknacks. Or there's some really cool people there who've, who've been having a party there all this time and are like, oh, hey, Mark, what's up? In the dream, I'm thinking, wait a minute, I've, I've lived here all this time and had no idea this room even existed? How could I have missed this? Ever had that dream? It's about our lives. Maybe those rooms are in parts of our lives we've neglected or that our souls want to explore. Have you ever thought there might be some undiscovered rooms in your soul? 
Anne Lamott describes writing as a metaphor for life. She tells aspiring writers, if there is one door to the castle you have been told not to go through, you must. Otherwise, you'll just be rearranging furniture in rooms you've already been in. She says most human beings are dedicated to keeping that one door shut. But the writer's job is to see what's behind that door. Well, it's also the job of anyone who longs to really know and experience God, to try the doors to unexplored rooms. It can be tempting for Christians to just rearrange furniture in rooms they've already been in. For many Christians, faith isn't just a house to live in. It's more like a fortress to be defended. And once they're safely inside, they assume that all they have to do now is just close the door, lock it, guard their faith from the enemy of doubt and uncertainty and protect it from the questions and paradoxes, keeping everything they believe safe, secure, and invulnerable. But when it comes to faith, what if there are doors to rooms we've never been in? What if in those rooms there's more to experience, more to encounter, more beauty, more wonder, more grace, more of God that can't be contained in the cramped little rooms we've been living in? Why the church? That's our question as we continue our Why Christian series. Why church? Why is church central to Christianity? What is it that when we come here, we find we can't live without? Well, first, let's be honest. Whatever it is for you, a growing number of Americans are living without it. In 1999, 70% of Americans said they belonged to a church. In 2018, that number fell to 50%. In 2020, it fell to 47%. And as religious affiliation has fallen, so has church attendance, especially in the wake of the pandemic. In 2019, 34% of Americans attended a religious service at least once or twice a month. In 2020, that fell to 31%. In 2021, it's 28%. Now, 2022, fell to 26 percent. What's going on here? I, I have a theory. For a growing number of people, the house the church has built is just too small and too confining and too restrictive. For too long, the church has told people there are doors they must never go through and rooms they're not allowed to explore. And instead of leading people through those doors and showing them who they can become, the church has told them who they must be and what they must believe, which to a lot of people just feels like rearranging the furniture in a room that's no longer interesting or inspiring. Why the church? There was a time when the church was thought of as something like a house, not just a physical house like an actual building, but as a metaphor for what it's like to belong to a family a family of people who are on the journey of faith together. The New Testament writers thought of church as something like the experience of living under the same roof and belonging to a household. In the years after Jesus, faith communities began to spring up. Most were underground communities because the Roman Empire made it a state crime to profess faith in Jesus as a son of God. At the time, only Roman emperors could be called son of God. Christians who claimed Jesus as Lord were executed. So Christians couldn't meet in public spaces. Instead, they met secretly in houses. It was house church. In the Greek, it was called ekklesia, often translated as church, but it really means gathering. Ekklesia is the root of ecclesiastical, which today refers to the institution of the church. But before church was an institution or a building, and before going to church meant worship and music and preaching and donuts, ecclesia was an underground gathering of 
about five to ten people, maybe as many as twenty, who all gathered for a meal and conversation. These gatherings were called love feasts, and love feasts resembled something like the Last Supper, when Jesus did some teaching and broke bread, passed the cup, and shared a meal with his disciples. This was ecclesia, and it looked like what families typically do in a house, loving, serving, caring for each other, eating together. It looked a lot like a household, and I think that's what ecclesia really means, household. And we've all belonged to a household, and we know there's no such thing as a perfect one. Households are messy. They're chaotic, perplexing, often insanely impossible, which is what 1 John is addressing in our passage today. 1 John was written right around the turn of the first century to a, a network of ecclesias in the city of Ephesus in response to some controversy over what it really meant to be a Christian. Today, many people will tell you what they think it means to be a Christian, but in the first century, it actually wasn't all that clear. Why? Well, for starters, back then, people didn't have Bibles like we have today. Some ecclesias had manuscripts or fragments of documents about Jesus and his teachings, but, but these writings wouldn't be considered biblical or authoritative for another 300 years or so. People didn't have little Bibles in their back pockets. The, the gospel was shared as spoken word in communal settings like love feasts. And that meant that if something controversial came up in the ecclesia, you, you couldn't just solve it by saying, hey, look now, the, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, second of all, they also didn't have any official doctrines. In fact, it would be another 225 years before Christians had any authorized creed explaining who Jesus really was and what it meant to be a Christian. That meant that there was a lot of space and freedom for people to think and ask questions and disagree about what a Christian really was. And last of all, they, they didn't have any official rule book for how to deal with controversies or to draw boundaries around what Christians could and couldn't do in the ecclesia. And can you imagine the chaos? I mean, what's a church without rules, right? We United Methodists have a 500-page rule book. We, we form committees to study issues, and every four years we spend millions of dollars in two long weeks and mind-numbing meetings debating and voting on those issues. And wow, <laughs> just look what it's done for us, right? All the problems we've avoided. How did ecclesias ever survive without a book of discipline? So they had no Bible, no creeds, no rule book. They were building the airplane while they were flying it. And it was wonderful. And it was beautiful. And it was so, so hard. Because people are hard. And keeping a household together is even harder. So what do you do when you don't have a Bible or a creed or a rule book to teach you what it means to be a Christian? Well, according to 1 John, you act like a Christian. You live the way Jesus lived. You love the way Jesus loved. And by doing so, over time, you become a Christian. In the ecclesia, right action was far more important than right belief. But still, how do you love the way Jesus loved? That's the question at the heart of today's passage. There are, there are lots of ways to, to love. Have you ever been in the Starbucks drive through when the person in the car in front of you pays for your order and then you're um, invited, guilted into passing on the love by paying for the guy behind you? I don't know why. It happens to me a lot. I pull up to the window. The cashier says, hey, good news. The guy ahead of you just paid for your coffee. And would you like now to pay for the lady in the car behind you? And I look in my rearview mirror and think, well, what would you
would Jesus do? Would he pay for her grande, iced, skinny, vanilla, upside down, caramel macchiato? Jesus would probably want me to do that for her. To do for her what the guy in front of me did for me. And so I smile and I hand over my credit card. And it turns out that lady behind me ordered drinks and breakfast sandwiches for her entire family of six. My $37 grande dark roast coffee never tasted so good. Now that's one way to love. But that's not the kind of love the writer of 1 John is describing. Because the ecclesia isn't a drive through of strangers, it's a family of people you actually know. And some of whom you probably don't like or understand. And some of whom you might think are just really weird. And to live in that kind of household requires a different kind of love. What kind of love am I talking about now? A few weeks ago, we, we talked in a series about how in the creation story, there's all that chaos and darkness and formless void floating around before any real thing exists in the universe. This is in Genesis. All that stuff is in the Hebrew called tohu vavohu. It means something like the wild and waste between being and non-being. And what, what does God say to the tohu vavohu? God says, let there be. To the darkness, God says, you, you can be, become light. And, and it did. And to the disordered chaos, God says, you can become life. And it did. To all the tohu va vohu out there in the world, and to all the tohu va vohu in you, God says, you can become this. That's generative love. That beckoning, summoning to become the promise and potential God sees in us. That's a, that's a generative love that draws us into the process of becoming. If that doesn't make sense, just think of it this way. First John calls it perfecting love. He says, um, God is love and those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. In other words, that love is in us. It's in us, but it, it hasn't yet fully matured. And that's why sometimes it's really hard to love certain people because the love within us hasn't quite reached perfection. Can you think of anyone right now who's really hard to love. In those hard to love moments, our natural default is fear, the fear of getting hurt, getting angry, being wrong, being conned, feeling forgiveness, feeling compassion. Fear is always ego stuff. And fear is the room we live in most of the time. We rearrange a lot of furniture in that room over the course of our lives. But first, John suggests maybe there are more rooms in our souls to explore. He says, perfect love casts out fear. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. That word perfection, it means maturity or ripeness. It's what happens when the tohu va vohu within us becomes what it's meant to be, calling us out of the room called fear. The writer calls us into a different room called perfect love. He says, you can become this perfected love by constantly remembering that God first loved us. Maybe that doesn't sound so radical at first, but think about this. God actually loved you first, even you. You of all people. You know everything about you, everything, even the things that aren't very lovable. God, God loved that. 
And when you remember this in those hard-to-love moments with others, you can try that door and walk into that room in your heart that you didn't even know existed. And in that moment, your heart expands. Your soul, that enlarges. And you become a different person. Why the church? Well, because the church at its best whispers to each of us and all of us together, you could become this. It can happen in you. Perfect love. If you're willing to try that door. There are other great reasons for the church, but none more important than being perfected in love. You can't be perfected in love by taking a walk on the beach or hiking in the mountains or meditating on your own. All of these are great, don't get me wrong. But eventually, you need people, even hard to love people, to perfect your love. You need to sit down with your adversary at a table, at a love feast, where you have to hold his hand during the prayer and ask her to please pass the salad dressing and, and maybe even give him a, a ride home afterwards. And that's why, church. New rooms. An enlarged soul. The chambered nautilus is a species of cephalopod known for its extraordinary spiraling chambered shell. It belongs to a genus that has barely changed since appearing in the fossil records 500 million years ago, before the dinosaurs. It's a native of the tropical Pacific. It lives in the deep waters of the open ocean. The Nautilus is a symbol of growth and transformation. When it first hatches, it wears a shell of about eight chambers, but as it matures, it outgrows its present home. Unlike some animals that shed their skins like snakes or others that shed their shells like hermit crabs, the, the, nautilus, the nautilus doesn't grow by shedding its shell. It grows by gaining more living space, by building new chambers connected to the old ones. Its shell slowly spirals outward. And when the nautilus moves into the new chamber of its shell, it closes off the chamber it was once in. The old chambers are still useful. They hold air, which provides neutral buoyancy. And they help create greater stability and control as the nautilus moves through the water. But the nautilus never has to go back and live in them. Never. New rooms lead to an enlarged life. Why church? Because at its best, the church calls to us saying, you could become this. Saying, perfect love casts out fear. Saying, there's a new room I want you to see.